everybody to uh, another session of Transforming Consciousness, the Myth Salon. Today we are quite blessed to have John Colarusso, who comes to us from Canada. I'm going to let Will say much more about him. I feel like we were going to want to repeat what we said before when you were talking before we opened it. But let me do a little bit of an opening. And um, instead of trying to bring the singing bowl, I'm going to tap it today. And let's see if that works. And um, I do love the slow opening of the singing bowl, and I miss doing it live. But uh, first thing I want to do is I want to fire up my candle. I want to start off with just a few words of what we choose to fight is so tiny. What fights with us is so great. If only we would let ourselves be dominated as things do by some immense storm, we would become strong too. When we win, it's with small things and the triumph itself makes us small. Lines from Rilke. But it reminds me of Michael Gellert. Being small means needing others. It means being able to depend upon others. It means not always being in a rush. Being small can simply mean being humble, which is in fact big. It means being content and understanding your inner center. And I'd like to say one more thing about from a friend of mine with whom I collaborated on a book called Cultivating the Still Point. Of all the human senses, perhaps the most unique and necessary to our survival and evolution is our capacity for self-awareness, to see ourselves in the center of what is happening in space and time, to abstract ourselves and to reflect upon it. Beautiful book, beautiful man. So, welcome. Once again, we are in a place where I'm gonna go back to this. I'm gonna, Rumi tells us to speak a new language so that the world will be a new world. And that's what we need to do. We need to revision the world during this moment that we're faced with. We're going to come out of this three or four months down the road. Things are going to be different. Contrary to what's coming out of the, the administration in Washington, things will be different. We, we won't touch as easily. We won't gather as easily. We're going to have to learn new language. And it's going to remake ourselves in the image and likeness of something that knows that there's limits to the world that we that we inhabit. So I'd like to turn it over to you, Will, if you'd say a few words about John. And if you will, you know, go around and share with everyone who the panel is and how we came about this, because this is an evolution of our myth salon that up until the pandemic, we met in my home every month for four years. And we've had wonderful, wonderful people in that time. Many of them are going to come 
and be with us in the myth salon as it goes and takes to the web. I'm just gratified that a lot of us have made the transition to the web because the web may, it turns out, maybe this is our saving grace. Maybe this is the saving, the, the silver lining of, of what's going to come out of this. Hopefully we will not lose sight of the intimacy that we're all capable of, but the long road, the long road ahead of us. So with that, my friend, take it away, Will. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. And what a paradox that uh, as we have reached maximum isolation uh, in our reality, we're, we're also reaching a level of connectivity that we've never experienced. Uh, kind of a beautiful coming together of two threads. Um, before we get started, I, I want to do what we did again last week, uh, which is uh, just take a moment. Um, I know that many people listening, uh, probably some people on this panel have people that they're worried about, uh, have maybe people that they've even lost. Uh, so uh, just a, a couple breaths that I'll ask all of us to share, uh, share our love with everybody together for a second. Well, as we get started, I'd, I, uh, I'd like to continue Dana's focus on community. I think that's probably the main focus for me on all of these. We are responding to the COVID situation, uh, and we're doing so with a wide range of mythologists. Uh, today, we'll have John Calaruso, who I'll introduce further in a moment, and he uh, comes from some different territories of the mythological landscape than some of the rest of us on this panel. The same was true last week with Chris Vogler, who personifies a relationship between mythology and Hollywood. Uh, John is a linguist uh, and is especially, I, I met him through connections with the International Association for Comparative Mythology, and I hope that some of some members of that are on here tonight, and I hope that this event continues to display the wider net, the wider reach of mythology as we all uh, try to make sense of what's going on. And with that, I'd like to introduce our, our panelists uh, and their various backgrounds. Uh, I know you can see all their names, so I won't start pointing directions, but Dennis Slattery is an author, scholar, and faculty member at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Selena Matthews is an author and clinical depth psychologist. Uh, Voris is a scholar and professor at the University, uh, a philosopher and professor at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, Zaman is a scholar, poet, and Fulbright scholar and Sufi mystic who teaches at Pacifica. And Cindy Anderson is a mythologist, scholar, business owner, marketing expert, and professor. Our honored first responder to this week will be Richard Dugan, host of Tell Me Your Story and Stations Operations Manager for Santa Barbara News Press, 1290 AM, uh, and recordings of our radio series that, that we've been recording for years uh, called Mythosophia can be found on uh, mythosophia.net. And uh, while I'm making that point, I'll also say that, that John Calaruso and I recorded a full series as well called Deep Sight, uh, about seeing through mythic lenses, and that can be found on mythosophia.net as well. Uh, John Calaruso is the founding chair of the world's largest linguistics department at McMaster in Canada and served as an advisor to the Clinton administration on the wars in the Caucasus. One of the world's leading mythologists and Indo-European scholars, John holds degrees from Cornell, Northwestern, and Harvard, where he earned his PhD in linguistics. John's commentary is at once political, mythological, and psychologically focused on our contemporary situation. He's named this particular talk, uh, Myth and Mind, uh, which I find very interesting to have somebody from outside of our community, which is especially interested in the psychological qualities of myth, uh, to come speak to us from, from another background, coming to some similar conclusions and some unique uh, and, and divergent uh, inflections. Uh, so um, with that, I'll just remind everybody the way that we're going to flow. Uh, we're now going to hear from John for about a little bit, maybe 20 minutes or maybe a little bit more. 
uh, then our first responder, Richard, will, will jump in and ask the first uh, question or two. Uh, and then I will ask the next question uh, to signify that the panelists are now involved. And then we're going to try and wrap that part a little bit earlier. We have a, a few less panelists this time, and hopefully we can get to the audience and hear from you guys on the Sooner side this time. Uh, really looking forward to doing more with that. Uh, and with that, I hope you'll all uh, join me in welcoming. Do we, we, I guess we don't clap with welcomes, but uh, I hope you'll all join me internally uh, as, as we're all focused inwardly in welcoming John Calaruso. Thank you, John, for joining us. Oh, thank you, Will, for inviting me. I'm just trying to hear those internal applause and, and welcoming claps. <laughs> um, oh, very good. I see a few. Excellent. Thank you. Um, by, by training, I'm a linguist and I zeroed in uh, on the languages in the Caucasus area. Um, they turn out to be very elaborate, very alien to anything much around them. Uh, anything else in Eurasia or practically the entire planet, really. Um, and I uh, started reading uh, the tales, uh, Nart sagas they were called, Nart tales, uh, simply to keep the languages alive in my head. When I moved to Canada and no longer had any Circassians or Abkhazians uh, to deal with or talk to, uh, and it turned out to be a happy accident, and I found this amazing trove of material. Um, and what I do with it is perhaps in some ways trivial is not the right word, um, but in myth circles I know I'm called a mathematician, and it's not meant as a compliment. Uh, what I do is I look at a comparable material between traditions, say Norse um, and Vedic India, that kind of thing, or say Russian material and material from Ireland. And I try to find what I think are descendant materials, descendant parallels that in fact uh, are there because they come down uh, with distortions perhaps, but from an earlier a unified single tale of some sort. Um, and so uh, I try to retrieve earlier cognitive patterns of thinking as they would, would have been reflected in earlier forms of these tales. Um, the, the material I look at is material I assume has been passed down and is not in there. There, there are two sources for, for similarities. One is in fact uh, shared, historical, um, shared historical heritage. The other is a deeper sort of built-in kind of structure. The, the archetypes, the motifs, um, I mean, the, the motif index out of Indiana Press is like eight or nine volumes now. Um, and uh, these reflect sort of deeper patterns in the human mind about how people think of what it means to be human. The material I look at is a little more superficial. Um, although I'm aware of the, of the other and I ponder it, I don't know what, quite what to do with it, frankly. Um, but the historical material, I think, uh, helps in a, a crucial way uh, to form identities. And people uh, take in myth, every tradition, every culture, if it's in any way, um, if it's not too severely damaged, will retain some very old material. Uh, and it's recognizably old from the language often, and these things are memorized and passed down and whatnot. And they'll have very old material that we would label as a myth, and how the culture views this material itself and varies substantially uh, across the planet. Um, some see it as a sort of old fashioned garbage, others see it as religious revelation, uh, as two extremes perhaps, uh, for them to assess this but it helps to form identity in some way in a complex, multi-layered uh, process. Now, when I was called upon, because I have become friends uh, with the man who eventually became the Abkhazian secessionist leader, Vladislav Arzimba, we were both linguists, uh, and I became friends with the Russian Minister of Justice, uh, Yuri Kalmakov, um, who despite his name Kalmuk, and these are Mongol people, was actually Kabardian, Circassian. Uh, so I was called upon when the wars broke out in this part of the world to help the U.S. government figure out what in the heck was going on, who these people were. They hadn't a clue. Right? And it turns out that I found the transition between mythology and politics to be relatively seamless. Why? Because what politics does 
this help you form identity as well. And it does it in a very similar fashion, and it does it in a complex sort of layered way that uh, unfolds through a variety of, of forms over a period of years. This is not instantaneous. Um, and it meets needs, um, needs for self-assessment, needs for how we see ourselves, uh, but so does myth. Myth does that too. And um, it does it with a slightly different vocabulary and a different set of, of images. Uh, but again, images are crucial in myth. Um, and I, I always wondered about how someone who was born blind, for example, would take the myth if, if they were exposed to it. I've never had a chance to test that idea. But uh, the language of myth produces very vivid images of uh, villains and of heroes, uh, of situations that are challenges of one sort or another, usually to, to uh, the hero, that's what a hero is. Um, and so do this political indoctrination, if you will. I don't mean formal indoctrination, but the simple act of growing up and becoming aware of, of the nation in which you live. Uh, I'm an American. I'm a dual citizen. I've been in Canada for 44 years um, because I graduated when the academic job market collapsed. <laughs> um, and I've been here uh, ever since. Um, and I'm an American outside looking in, so to speak. Uh, so it's been very interesting to me to, to watch uh, the dynamics with this um, mess of a president uh, uh, right now. But uh, it's interesting to see because uh, he's doing what we do in linguistics. If you want to see what something really means, uh, say some weird piece on a verb, something like that, produce the form without that piece. See if you can make it break. See if you can make it dysfunctional in some way. And then you know, oh, I know what that is. That's the carburetor. Well, that's the brakes because I ran into a tree, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and he's, he's shutting, by violating all these things. He, he's casting, I think, enormous light onto what uh, the U.S. expects of itself, how it sees itself, and uh, what American identity means to a large proportion of Americans, not all. Um, and uh, of course, there's variability, and this is a, a complex issue. But I do think that by having studied myth, I was sort of pre-primed to uh, become a, a security advisor. Uh, I just found out today that someone in Washington <laughs> you know, who uh, was going over my profile. I have a way of checking on that. Um, so you know, who knows? Um, and um, uh, I have written some pieces, six pieces that were anti-Trump pieces that were syndicated. Uh, so uh, I haven't done anything in the last uh, year and a half, but uh, for a while they were sort of hot on that because it was simple. It was simple. Uh, it was like writing a myth piece, uh, in a way. I do think that there are some other features of myth that uh, are diagnostic. We should perhaps talk about later uh, things I'd like to know your opinions about. Um, for example, it's a genre uh, within a spectrum of material called folklore. Um, and we have children's things where the animals are talking, like Winnie the Pooh and that sort of thing. Uh, we call them fables. Um, we have just folk tales of one sort or another. But what makes myth different? When you come into it, you know you're in the wine cellar of the human mind. Um, this is material that is somehow extraordinarily evocative. It asks questions that other genres of folklore will not ask and tries to answer them. Like, where did the universe come from? Why? What's its purpose? Will it end? How will it end? Why will it end? And you don't get those questions and those answers in any other genre. Um, it has heroes that have peculiar... There are guys in folktales that do grand things. There are ladies that do marvelous things um, and have special attributes like Rapunzel with their hair or whatever. But what... What strikes me as so, um, so peculiar about myth is that when a hero uh, is, is crucial to the emergence of some cycle of, of stories, uh, he, and it's always, it's always a man unless a woman has to step in, and that can happen too, um, it, it, he is born in some very peculiar way. He's never born normally. And he's typically born through his mother's sides, like a caesarean. And of course, I'm sure that Julius Caesar 
his mother never had a cesarean, but that he being seen as a hero was attributed to a hero's birth uh, coming through his mother's side. The storm god Indra in Vedic India also emerges through his mother's side in some accounts. Um, and then he, they're abducted, like Moses among the bulrushes, sometimes put in a, in a stream, that's a common motif. They are in some way um, rescued and then go upon their career. When they are emerged, when their special properties and destiny as heroes are uh, uh, manifested, they typically change their name. Uh, so Heracles, Hercules, started out as Palaimon when he uh, kills his family in a berserker rage. <clears throat> he has to go seek penance uh, from the Delphic Oracle, and she gives him a different name, the glory of Hera, Heracles. Um, and it's also true of Achilles. Uh, it's true of um, any number of heroes. The Nart Saga is the material I work on, actually in some ways is deficient. And while I assume that it's old, it does seem that way, uh, it has many of the tone, has the tone of, of myths that I'm used to. It lacks a, a well, it, it, it lacks a conventional mythic creation myth. Uh, they say, uh, um, the world makes itself. Um, the world is self-creating. Very strange, and they have no idea about how it's going to end. Um, it's the only tradition I know in which the, the universe sort of self-emerges in some way. It's very, very peculiar. They also have it built in that the world is round. Um, and again, these must be later uh, later influences, perhaps, although they, they don't seem that way in the context uh, of the tale. Um, so heroes, good people, bad people, seen in politics, um, and uh, special uh, careers, so to speak, in, in the myths, same thing in politics. Uh, John McCain is suffering prolonged torture and confinement uh, in Vietnam as a POW. Uh, actually, probably unwittingly, uh, gave himself a pedigree of, of typical heroic proportions. Um, and Trump again by saying, I want well, I could care for people that are tied up and captured, <laughs> simply revealed the significance of, of McCain's ca being captured and being POW. Um, so thank you, Donald. <laughs> it was useful. Um, so it's, it's a, a fascinating field. It's the one that came to me halfway through my career. And um, it's one that uh, I find. Um, um, people need in some way. It meets a profound uh, human craving. Uh, that is, I think, a deepest form of self-identity in some sense, cultural identity, group identity of some sort. And uh, people also typically end up doing this in politics. So when I was advising Washington and acting, I acted as a go-between between Washington and Moscow, um, the the um, fervor, the dedication of the, the career people in government uh, was almost all consuming. And it struck me in some ways that what I was seeing was the process of self-identity, but now shifted entirely away from the traditional uh, forms taken in myth um, and now uh, institutionalized and projected into the um, the history of the United States and to its government organs. Uh, the very best people, I think, um, were entirely identified with government. Uh, they had very minimal family lives, often no children. Um, and they spent hours, you know, so 12, and I had to do this too, 12, 18 hour days, day after day. Um, and it was very hard for me to do. Um, and it was really difficult for my wife, who we had two small children at the time, and I spent nine years um, zipping around at the behest of Washington, eight for Clinton and one for W. And W was a waste of time. <laughs> it's no surprise. Um, but I do think that it's, it shows, too, that politics is not going to leave us, that it is something that 
is crucial and vital to human identity, just as myth is crucial and vital to human identity as well. Uh, I think the kinds of, of uh, tensions we see in politics are perhaps to be explained otherwise, um, simply because we're a cultured uh, form of animal, an animal that has, has to learn a lot of what it must do and what it should do. Uh, and such an organism is always stuck between the retention of older techniques, older attitudes and, and uh, information uh, that was useful and might be useful again, so it shouldn't be discarded, but also requires innovation and adaptation. Uh, so there's always going to be conservative versus uh, uh, innovative or liberal in some way. Um, and if this tension doesn't exist, the organism's adaptation of culture is futile. Culture allows you to change without dying. And you can carry on with your gene pool pretty much intact and, and adjust to different circumstances as we are having to do now. Um, so it, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. Now, the other thing I think it's important, I think the coronavirus, uh, it's called SARS-CoV-2 or something, is actually the virus, but corona, uh, uh, COVID-19 is, is the disease, um, is that something, something weird, something very strange has happened. Uh, and it began uh, perhaps in ancient India, ancient Greece, it was taken up again in, in the Muslim world, uh, Arab world, Iran, the Abbasids, the Abbasid dynasty, um, Abbasid Caliphate, Khalif, Khalifa Caliphate, uh, was Iranian based, came into Europe, uh, bloomed uh, because of a number of oddities, uh, particularly abstract notation invented by an Italian accountant, apparently. Um, that the way of thinking became what we call scientific. Uh, in German, Wissenschaft, which is knowledge, really. Um, witship uh, would be the English cognate. Uh, wit being uh, intellect, um, and we we now have this embedded pattern and habit in very important sections of the society that we have used to make lots of money. And that's probably the crucial thing that happened in Europe as opposed to elsewhere. The telescope Galileo pointed at um, the rings of Saturn and so forth. Telescope had existed for apparently 10 or 12 years by the time Galileo got his hands on one, and it was simply used by harbor masters to identify incoming ships for trade. It was never pointed at the sky, but you know, Galileo managed to do it. it. Took him a while to get around to it. And the point I'm making here is that if you look at what is happening with COVID, it's invisible. You can be polluted with it and still be quite normal for a couple of weeks, infecting everyone you know and love. That's why we're in isolation. And then you get this horrible, devastating fever and you're sick for, for days, weeks perhaps. Um, so it looks like a miasma. It's insidious. One of my friends says, it's insidious. You can't smell it, you can't touch it, you can't see it. Yes, it's like a miasma. It's exactly like divine retribution in a way. Very hard for me not to feel this about Trump. <laughs> Some other forces of the cosmos have actually turned on, on uh, good old Donald. Um, the, the thinking that would see it that way would be mythic thinking, imagistic, um, uh, thinking of the universe in some way as uh, shaped to human needs and human passions. Um, and this would have been the, the dominant view of, say, the Black Death um, or any number of other plagues that uh, happened before, before this one. But the 1819 flu uh, after World War I, um, this was now subject to scientific scrutiny. Uh, and this uh, 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 epidemic or plague is also subject to scientific scrutiny. The thinking is very different. Um, and if you don't have that habit of thinking, if you don't at least respect it, uh, I read math books as a kind of hobby. And I, I wonder about what I'm doing sometimes because, gee, do you really say that? And it doesn't make sense. You know, I can only follow so far. So thank goodness uh, I went into linguistics instead. <laughs> um, it's, it's an issue of, 
of sensibility of what you think is plausible. <clears throat> and what we have, or what you have in the United States right now is a precedent surrounded by people who think in a medieval fashion, who have not embraced this novel innovation. Well, well, it's 500 years old now, right? But this innovation in human history of, of this weird, odd, consequential way of thinking, stepwise thinking, looking at all the you know, kind of data, looking at the world and so forth. Um, and they haven't embraced that and they can't manage it. And I would say now that it's not just that they can't spell, which of course they can't apparently, um, and they can't simply sit down and go through paperwork and manage to get production going and various components and necessary things. It's that they uh, are confronted with a, a situation that stuns them. They are stuck in, in mythic thinking and they can't, they can't get out. Um, they can't meet the needs. And uh, if you had an administration where the individuals and the advisors and all uh, were prone to scientific habits of thought, I don't think the United States would be in this mess now. Uh, there would be far fewer deaths and far fewer uh, illnesses. Um, so I think that what's interesting about mythic thinking and political thinking too uh, is that it's clearly limited in some ways. So it's absolutely essential. Everyone seems to have it. But you can only go so far with it, and then you have to lapse into something else. And this is what weird thing that's happened in the Western world with its predecessors, as I just suggested elsewhere, that it has uh, elevated kind of thinking uh, that seems, seems to be natural only to a small um, percentage of the population. Uh, but has been utilized. Look at what we're doing here. This is entirely the product of mathematical work originally by, by John von Neumann and Norbert Wiener on uh, automata, or called automata, and uh, then Alan Turing, and he actually implemented one, and began to make a machine that mimicked the mathematics. Right? Um, so without that kind of odd thinking and without uh, recognizing the talents of individuals gifted in this way, uh, we'd probably entirely be stuck in mythic thought and, and convinced that what was happening to us was the revenge of the universe for our hubris or something like that. I'm not I'm a little surprised, actually, we haven't heard more of that kind of thinking uh, from a, some of Trump's base, perhaps. Um, so I think that's an important aspect of myth as well, that it goes so far, but, but uh, is old and universal and needed, necessary, but it's not enough. We need more. Um, and I think that that's, that's a very important distinction, uh, understanding to reach and to make in some way. Um, I think that's about all I wanted to float out. Uh, uh, pass it. I don't know how long I've been babbling. How, you nailed it. That was exactly uh, 20 minutes. Thank you, John. And, and uh, uh, I'm really questions. interested to hear what you, what you think and, and how oh. you feel. I'm definitely ready to jump in, but I better introduce uh, Dr. D. Richard Dugan first, our first responder. Right. Uh, thanks for joining us, Richard. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a Reverend Dr. D to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, glad you're here. John, what I find interesting uh, out of what is, is coming out of, and of course you brought up the administration, obviously the governmental bodies literally around the world, but mm. ours in particular, uh, no other country that I am aware of, and bear in mind, I don't want, I try not to watch too much news so I don't take this stuff in because sometimes the information that is, that we are bombarded with is almost as bad as the virus itself, mm, yeah. if not worse. Yeah. But they have managed here in this country to, if, if I can use this word, it may be the wrong word, they have managed to anthropomorphize this virus. We have an enemy. We are at war. I have never known a time in my life, and I'm almost 60, where we went to war against a biological agent. But I will give credit here. For the first time in my lifetime, they've actually done something differently though I think a little late, in shutting things down. Now, they should have shut the airlines down for two weeks back in, say, January, and we probably would not be where we are today. Two weeks, minimal economic disruption, 
and it's over. But they didn't do that. They waited until, what was it, March. So I'm curious about your observations of, and again, if I'm using the wrong word, correct me, please, the anthropomorphization, if that's even a word, of this virus and the fact that we are in a wartime state. Yeah, it's a very good point you make. Um, and I, th I think that part of, the, part of searching for a name for it is part of this effort to uh, make it an enemy in some way. Um, so it's the Chinese virus or whatever that they're trying to do uh, with, and, and political consequences be damned. Um, I simply think that uh, Trump has surrounded him. Trump is, is suffering from what I believe to be frontotemporal dementia. Uh, and this is not my original diagnosis uh, to my colleagues. I mean, the reason we have this huge linguistics department of about 50 students every year, um, uh, undergraduate, is because we, we channel them towards speech pathology. So we have people who are particularly uh, up on speech uh, abnormalities and, and, and disorders. Uh, and there was an Englishman in a poll who uh, came up with this diagnosis within a few weeks of Trump's inauguration. Um, he's mentally defective. And I think the great debate will be, uh, can he be held morally responsible? Because we're gonna find out later that his brain is diseased in some way. Um, and I think that he has surrounded himself with people who will simply do anything they possibly can to, to retain what little power he's given them. Uh, I had a small taste of power, or uh, at least, well, perhaps influence would have been a better word. I helped stop one of the wars. I helped start a, a plastic surgery program for women who had been uh, mutilated in one of the wars. I monitored three, well, three wars. Um, and uh, it's power or influence is a very heady very heady drug. And these people in Washington who identify with the government, in many cases, they want that power. They want that fix, so to speak. It's like literally like something, someone on some kind of substance. Um, and I think that they just simply were unable to deal, to know what to do. Uh, they didn't want to shut down the economy. They didn't want to shut down the airlines. They didn't want the wealthy, um, uh, industries to, to, to suffer catastrophic and abrupt um, re reductions in, in income, money flow. Uh, I think that was one of the chief considerations. I think the other one was they just did not know what to do. They just couldn't believe it would hit them and it would be bad. Uh, and I think this ties into one of the um, self-images of Americans is that it's a special country uh, with special capabilities and um, it's actually, give me if I'm wrong, it's in political science, it's called American exceptionalism. It's actually a doctrine. So I, I think the populace, I mean, we began, we began hoarding back in January, uh, my wife and I, uh, worrying that this would come. Uh, I think most Americans did not. And there are lots of Canadians who have not, who are not caught without adequate supplies and and are quite stunned about everything and don't take it very seriously. Uh, even though in my neighborhood we have uh, at least one case uh, a few blocks away. Um, and I don't know any details about it, but uh, it's real. Um, so I think they just didn't know what to do. I just think it was beyond the horizon of what they imagined as possible in some way. One other point I'd like to ask you about in this same, along the same line, <laughs> is the reality uh, that they've set up of have to, having to have an enemy. I don't know of any time in my brief 60 years on this planet where we haven't been at war against someone or something. Mm -hmm. And actually we were it seemed like things were kind of settling down around the world back in uh, October, November, December, and everything was kind of just going along status quo. And then this kicks up. 
And now we have to, ha it's like, it's as if we can't seem to get through a period of time without an enemy. Is there uh, something in mythology that also talks to that chronic problem with uh, certain societies that for some reason they have to have a certain element at all times or they're deficient in their ability to function? Yeah, precisely. Uh, having an adversary if not an outright enemy, but an antagonist, is mm -hmm. a very important dynamic for group identity. And you see it in myths. I mean, there's always the gods versus the giants. There's always the hero versus a monster or villain. Um, and one, one tries to, to um, stick with, with the logic of this and making successful films or, or plays uh, as well. And this is simply at, at the governmental level. Um, uh, the use of, of a, a nation um, to be a, a foil, so to speak, that helps mm -hmm. you define your power and your influence because you are able to push them back or screw them or do whatever. Um, and, and in some ways, I mean, I don't want to talk too, too sympathetically about Vladimir Putin, but in some ways he, he was spurned. Uh, he made overtures. Um, there, there's a monument in Bayonne, New Jersey, looking across from where the Twin Towers were. It's a big teardrop. It was donated by Russia in commiseration for the t attack of 9-11. No one ever hears about it. Why? Because Russia is a necessary enemy. It's a necessary adversary. And Putin, of course, understands this now and is himself using the West as a necessary adversary. Um, and this, so this is a precise parallel between the uh, thinking of, of politics and the thinking in myth. And it's why they have, they have had trouble preparing for COVID-19. It's because they already had all their myths, uh, excuse me, all their enemies in place. And here comes a biological event that, that sort of makes all that trivial in some way. It throws it all into the background. Uh, and so I think even the, the few, like Fiona Hill, well, she, she was an advisor to Trump. I know Fiona quite well. Um, there were competent people, but they were probably were, were not able in any way to persuade um, uh, the mentally defective president uh, to take appropriate action against uh, a biological, biological threat. And it's also why it's being anthropomorphized uh, and made into a kind of uh, enemy uh, with which we are at war. You Let know, me uh, ask one more question, if I may, uh, very me? briefly. Will, you'll get a kick out of this question. Yeah. Will, uh, Do uh, John, um, yes. one of the thoughts that has occurred to me, if we do indeed have this quote-unquote enemy, mm -hmm. then it has sentience, it has a consciousness, it has a self-awareness, and the comment I would make to that is, where is the prime directive when you need it? This is a, a living being that has every right to exist just like you and me, and we need to understand it, try to communicate with it, to coexist. You can respond to that or not, but I just make that um, uh, ironic comparison to this whole aspect of being at war. Well, two things. One, the biologists are not even sure whether they should classify viruses as alive or not. They reproduce, which is one of the criteria for, for being alive, but they can't do it without being a parasite. They're largely RNA forms of life, ribonucleic acid as opposed to deoxyribonucleic acid. So it's almost as though they're a relic from an earlier biological experiment and is now, have now been reduced to parasites on DNA life. Um, <laughs> but I think that uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein had something important to say about this. He said, if a lion could talk, it would have nothing to say to a human being. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you have to have some shared base, some shared commonality of some sort of cognitive um, or, or physical in some way. And, and if the if coronavirus is going to tell us anything, I don't think we'd ever understand it. <laughs> right. You know, uh, 
Thank you, uh, Richard. And one of the threads I want to pick up on and, and just comment on really quickly is one thing we're learning uh, is that it is completely possible to have a war, uh, spending $2 trillion, bringing out the war bonds, getting the country to work, front lines, you name it. We are now learning that you can have a full-on war without a traditional enemy. And that's one thing I wonder how, how that will affect us. But I wanted to seize uh, on, a, on your conversation about identity and politics. And I find that to be really interesting uh, about how the, the two are really uh, partners in the formation of a cultural identity, your political identity, your mythological identity. And of course, uh, of course, there was a time where Marx was making a big point out of how the state was displacing a mythological identity with a kind of political identity. And of course, by now, uh, we can't get around the fact that they're living uh, side by side in some way or another. You also talked about um, one of the one of the things that you do is a stress test. You know, if I if I put this stress on a system, what will I learn? You know, what will break and what can I learn? And of course, that's how security tests are done these days. That's how we test for uh, all kinds of flaws and vulnerabilities. And certainly we're exposing tons of vulnerabilities. But I want to focus on identity. And, and I want to ask, you know, what there are a few different identities, uh, conflicts of identity that I see undergoing a severe stress test, and you touched on several of them, and, and I'll just mention, a, mention it a little bit and ask you to respond. The first is a kind of split between a scientific and a medieval modality, that we've certainly seen a divide in our culture between those who accept the science of climate change and those uh, who deny it on, on non-scientific basis, typically. So there is a major uh, split in modality that has become a split in identity. And, and one of the things that I see going on is um, even, even the people that were opposed to looking at science to make sense of things, it's as though they're going through a great ritual of accepting science is a valuable modality. The other is, the other couple identities I wanna point out are, are capitalism versus, uh, are we a capitalist country? Are we our economy? or are we the people of America? And which one comes first? You know, where, where do we identify? And what about our values, right? Are we our, are we, are we our values or are we our people? Um, and then, and that's a complicated, twisted question. And then, you know, with that too, uh, are we a nation state or are we a planet is another identity under a severe stress test. And then, you know, at a more, at a more abstract level, it's a real stress test to, our emphasis on individuality is our identity and the collective is our, is our identity. So I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to how you see the stress test to our political and mythological identities uh, unfolding. <laughs> okay, me <laughs> and not, not Richard. All right. Um, <laughs> Richard, you want to say something? No, uh, hell. no, no. no. <laughs> um, look, I, I think that um, the scientific let's talk about science and scientific identity for a moment uh, and I certainly know when, when I was growing up uh, and Richard I'm 74 going on 75 so uh, you, you take your vitamins and, and do your walking and you'll, you'll be in good shape too um, there's all this emphasis on you know, science and science, science, and, and uh, I still get emails from my university, uh, careers in science and whatever like that. And what I found personally very strange about science, um, whether it may be math or, or, um, uh, or say physics, I was in physics, uh, is that there's something that's mundane and almost trivial about it. Um, and there's a kind of, of cold, very, um, very efficient sort of logical reasoning that I myself did not bring to my studies. I had to learn it. I learned it from a girlfriend. Uh, I said, oh, that's what you do. Well, I can do that too. Uh, so, um, but some people seem to come by it naturally. And what's weird about science is it starts from these trivialities and builds up into this enormous complicated uh, cognitive domain. Um, and then, if you're you're clever and sharp, you know. Hey, for example, I was my wife made some delicious turkey pies this evening, and I was washing the pot, and I noticed that the pot was not Teflon; it was a ceramic that was utterly smooth. 
what ceramic is that? It's zirconium oxide. Where do you get zirconium? It's a periodic table, you know, so forth and so on. So we now live in this radically interconnected domain of technology where we have very fine, fancy pots that no longer stick. You can still have Teflon if you want, but you know, this doesn't matter if you get a scratch in it, it's not toxic like Teflon. So on it goes. And it's weird because obviously it's, it's a new way of thinking. I always think of Aristotle. Aristotle had a work by biology on biology. And he said, a horse has so many teeth. I don't remember the number. I think it was 28 or something. Like that. A horse has so many teeth. And that's not the number of teeth a horse had, has. So I don't know why Aristotle put down that number, but he clearly never looked at the skull of a horse or looked at the mouth of a horse. Um, and you have to go out and do that if you want to be a scientist. Um, so there's this kind of contemptible pedestrian base level to this glorified, amazing cognitive domain. So it's a very strange way of thinking in, a, in, a, in, a, in its own way in some way. Uh, and I can see why, for say the majority of the population, uh, it's alien and something that they take for granted. They're happy to have their nice shiny pot with a smooth interior, and the heck with the rest of it, and on they go. Um, and they they simply uh, like lots of shows and movies because why? Because those reinforce myth patterns um, uh, that are easily accessible in some way. Um, but I think that this is a major a major shift in the history of the human species uh, in its ability to exploit and promote this peculiar way of thinking, peculiar, I'd say. Um, and I mean, you, get, you get the same kind of patterns uh, in, in mathematics too. One and one is two and whatnot. I, one of my favorite things was I had a little talk where I started doing very simple arithmetic. I said, anything I can do, I want to be able to undo. Uh, so it's called an inverse. And I was able to end up with a number called an octonion, which is eight components. And we don't, even the mathematicians are not entirely sure how those behave. Um, they're an ongoing topic of research in math. And all you do is you get it out of simple, what I want is two, and you know, two minus one is one. <laughs> and if you do that alone, you can build that all, all the rest of it up. Um, and that's at the very heart of this peculiar new form of, of thinking. Um, now, what are we part how do we see ourselves to some extent identity is vital and universal because it's functional and it's useful because it's flexible so at times if we're worrying about the brazilians burning down their their rainforest it's the planet and everybody on it because we need the, those trees for oxygen um and Sometimes if it's, you know, you're young and you're trying to date and find a mate, uh, there's going to be something, uh, some, some other idea of promoting certain, certain views of yourself and, and trying to present yourself in certain ways. Um, and I think that uh, clothing has become, and logistic again, clothing has become a very important part. Um, I, don't want to, I didn't emphasize images enough. The language of mythology evokes images, but a successful political campaign or party will have certain symbols and images. Uh, and I think part of the chaos and craziness of what's going on in the U.S. is that both parties, the GOP and the Democrats, have failed to latch on to certain kinds of images. I mean, Trump has it with this little simple, stupid MAGA hat, okay? But that's still a step ahead of any, any Democrats that put forward. And if you look at history, uh, for example, say the Soviet Union and all these medals I myself behind me, you can see a little box right there. There's a medal in there I got from, from, uh, from Russia. Um, uh, they were selling, I was in Moscow, they were selling just for, for a few American dollars uh, medals that, that their grandfather had something I got at the Battle of Stalin. It was nothing, it was garbage. Uh, so when the symbology of a regime and a political entity uh, loses its value, it means that politically it's dead. Um, and I think that the chaos and turmoil among the parties in the U.S. is also uh, in part due to a failure to embrace a certain program of images. Um, and You'll see it, the campaign ads come close, but not, not quite.
Uh, so I, I do think that uh, it's a multi-dimensional uh, thing. And the other thing I was going to say, uh, you see when the Nazis inflicted the Holocaust upon the Jews and others, typically one of the things they did, did was they stripped them of their clothes. One of the things you do with a prisoner, uh, Harvey Einstein, or you put him in jail, whatever, they have an orange suit, whatever. Uh, so this in a way uh, destroys a vital uh, imagistic component of social identity and replaces it with a stigmatized uh, form of identity. John, let me uh, ask you um, to maybe touch upon this. You've sort of touched upon it already, but we have another divisive situation developing in this country. People are getting tired of staying at home. Mm -hmm. And I am hearing people hollering out at protests I'm an American and I have a constitutional right to blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But there's also a line in, I want to say it's probably the Declaration of Independence that talks about promoting the general welfare, mm -hmm. which to me supersedes any individual rights and freedoms that one might have if it endangers the general welfare. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm uh, asking for a short answer on this one. I really want to uh, let the rest of the panel in. Okay. Well, just very, very quickly, I mean, one of the things, I came up with certain terminology when I was writing political memos, some of which actually became part of the currency vocabulary in Washington. Um, but I, I call the American condition now radical individualism or radical egalitarianism. So... Uh, the fulfillment of the individual, the gratification of the individual is paramount over everything else. Uh, the trouble with that is that that atomizes the domain of values and it makes group welfare uh, problematic and seen as a tyrannical imposition because it's nullifying a, a atomistic, individualistic uh, program for, for validation and, and fulfillment. So radical individualism. Thank you for touching on that. That's been a theme I've been focused on. Um, I see Voris has got his, his mic unmuted. Maybe he's uh, ready to jump in with us. No, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm certainly willing to put more questions forth unless someone else wants to jump in. I think I see there's Dennis trying to unmute, it looks like. Well, let me say this as well. If you subscribe, I got uh, it. Part, got of, it. part of the radical individualism, uh, it also means that you feel justified in rejecting, say, uh, the advice of an elite. Uh, in some ways, an elite is not a legitimate um, societal object uh, because we're all sort of out there to fulfill ourselves and it's just an opinion and blah, 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 and all that. So it has weakened the. Um, a necessary hierarchical structure of knowledge and skill that are essential uh, to a modern society. So Richard, just a, a, a little sidebar. Uh, when I read Edward Tick's book, uh, Warrior's Return, Restoring the Soul, <clears throat> he points out that since the founding of our country, we have not been at war for 12 years. And then late out. Years. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, John, you, you tripwired a number of things for me, and I want to just, I think spending my professional career reading classics and teaching classics of literature, I think this way of thinking analogically has just become part of uh, my identity and uh, how I see things. Mm -hmm. So I'm about 125 pages into Walter Isaacson's uh, Leonardo da Vinci biography. Mm -hmm. of almost 600 page book but it's reading like a novel mm -hmm. and Leonardo was one of those rare figures in history that combined um, scientific uh, this is one of your points mm -hmm. uh, scientific observation he looked closely at everything the way a bird's wing worked yeah. um, he uh, took cadavers and took the skin off their face to see how muscles work 
to allow us to smile. And of course, then painted the greatest smile in the history of art with the Mona Lisa. Mm -hmm. And then he had this fantastic um, imagination that saw analogies everywhere and created these marvelous inventions that were both scientific and uh, fantasy. And um, uh, when they were, when they, by others, when they were created, of course, they didn't work. They were, they were images of his imagination. Mm -hmm. So here's where I am. Um, and it swings back, it swings back to um, the beginning of your talk. My wife and I have been watching Ken Burns' series, and I, this all came up analogically as I listened to you, so I, I don't have a hold on it. But I think the title of the series is The Gene and Intimate History, and uh, it's off of a man's book. Well, while we were watching the second or third um, installment, uh, tracking uh, diseases by trying to locate the genetic abnormality or the genetic absence or the genetic dysfunction. And these are, I'm using your language here to make uh, this observation, uh, which I'd like you to make any observations off of. There was one point when they showed an image, and I may have this backward where there was a genetic strand, and on the strand were chromosomes spaced um, not always uh, uniformly apart. And I thought to myself, that's the structure of a narrative. And these are the moments in a narrative that gather heat, uh, create juice, uh, uh, elicit energy. Oh. Free song. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about what a genotype is as um, an archetype of biology. And I began to just fantasize how narrative patterns from the beginning of our making up stories to try to converse to others what we've learned um, are biologically anchored. In other words, and I'm going to steal Joe Campbell here, bios is mythos. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where I am with it, mm -hmm. that the genetic structure of us is the perhaps, and this is where I want to just indulge in a little bit of Leonardo's fantasy thinking. Um, that's where the narratives reside, in the genetic structures and the way that the double helix is always mirroring itself, uh, which is really the great thematic um, cohesive structure of Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. The doubling is uh, ongoing and constant. Mm -hmm. So, John, that's where I am. And anything that uh, you'd like to respond or other panelists, uh, please. Uh, anybody want to say something? Or I can say something. My wife says on my tombstone, she's going to put, let me say this about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> That'll um, work. That'll work. I guess it'll work, yeah. <laughs> um, let's say that there are a couple of, of, of comments I want to quote. One is by, from a, the physicist Enrico Fermi. And yeah. he said, there are only seven physics problems. Um, and then I want to turn to the Southern writer, William Faulkner. Good. Said there are only seven plots, <laughs> uh, and of course you know seven seven is a folklore number, right? Yeah. Um, the, the the existence, the cosmos, seems to have a limited number of fundamental patterns that uh, are repeated and build up complexity. And in linguistics, we we are fond of talking about what they call iteration. So there's a basic set of structures and then they compound uh, and repeat and are, are built up again and again and again. And this is where complexity actually comes from. And if complexity doesn't come that way, it just makes pure chaos. Um, and I want to say some, one other thing about science that superficially looks as though it, it, it contradicts what I said earlier. 
the scientists, when they when they argue and think this way, um, do it as a kind of end result of a process of imagining and thinking and pondering. And this is particularly true of mathematicians. My eldest son is a math prof. My mother had two degrees in math. Um, the the intuitions um, can be proven wrong. What they have to do is they have to prove it. And if as a physicist, they have to make a prediction that can be measured in a lab. And so for example, the current theory of string theory, as beautiful as it is and powerful as it is mathematically, has had trouble beginning to lose adherence because it doesn't make any predictions. It just simply hangs there right? as this glorious, very complicated, uh, theory. Um, so in a way, what the scientists and mathematicians are saying is that your intuitions really don't matter. What we want to see is the nitty gritty stuff that comes down to the end. Mm. And when you're doing historical linguistics, which I now spend a lot of my time doing as opposed to, to earlier uh, theoretical work, um, uh, I get these emails from a number of people saying, this word looks like that in uh, literally in Iroquois, Seneca, Mohawk, whatever, and in Indo-European, or you know, some, something like this, or in Chinese, you know, kind of thing. And I say, okay, that's an intuition. You've got to prove it. Uh, it's like going to court, and you, you're convinced that the, 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 the defendant is guilty, but you've got to prove it. <laughs> you can't just go in there with a the gut punch. Now, at least in mathematics, they have a category. They call it a, a, um, a conjecture. Okay, so and so is conjecture, and it's physics that don't have it. It's just a competing paradigm. But um, so even even in this very peculiar, lofty form of thinking, there is still this kind of gut int intuitive um, base uh, of, of of pondering and thinking about things. Um, so it's it's weird. And what kind, what kind of patterns we see? We see, as you say, the DNA. We see. <laughs> You get the same patterns out in the cosmos. You know, it's it's, it's crazy. Um, of course, DNA was one of those structures that was first imagined in a dream. Yeah, the benzene molecule also was imagined in a dream. Uh, a woman was the one that first came up with DNA, and Crick and Crick and Watson stole it from her, and then she died of cancer before it could be rectified. Yeah. I can't remember her name off here. Um, I'm doing good at my age to remember Crick and Watson, but. Um, Springs to mind, yeah, but it's it's strange. So, can we have experience without pattern? Um, is pattern absolutely essential for everything? Can't we just have sort of like your dancing Ganesha? Or is there a mm -hmm. pattern for that? Uh, yeah, um, I don't know. But, but the 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 occurrence of pattern is one of the great mystic things about reality. It's all over the place. Thank Speaking you, John. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Zaman's going to jump in with us. Um, I uh, wanted to um, go back to the point that Richard uh, made earlier, saying that uh, the virus has, has been anthropomorphized. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's probably the other way around. Um, this comes more from a warrior culture mentality. Mm -hmm. In warrior culture, you have to have an enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, without an enemy, the culture doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so then came this idea of uh, cultural relativism and the idea of political correctness. And in order to accommodate those two um, and, and still have an enemy uh, so that a war could be declared against them. We had several cases. There was uh, war on drugs for instance, a non-entity. Mm -hmm. But before jumping in there, I think that even when we had to declare war on, on an enemy, we had to um, dehumanize them in some way. Mm -hmm. oh, exactly. Yes. Um, otherwise, um, uh, if your enemy was not made look inferior, mm -hmm. then it's difficult to justify the action you're taking against them. Mm -hmm. So we went from war uh, against drugs, uh, war on terror, to war on coronavirus and all these. These um, are ways to accommodate that, to be 
politically correct, not to target any particular nation or any particular people, and yet allow oneself to declare, you know, themselves as the war president or some such a thing I heard recently. <clears throat> uh, that, that's one thing. The question on the identity part of it is, uh, when we are talking about nation state, that's a very Eurocentric concept. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in European nation states, especially in post-Westphalian European nation states, the state is defined in the, in the context of a particular people. Mm -hmm. So a exactly. nationhood becomes a necessary component in order for it to become a state. Whereas uh, outside of Europe, uh, uh, a state is more geographical mm -hmm. uh, and not necessarily um, defined in, in, in terms of a particular people. So there is no nation state. There are states, uh, for instance, Iraq, that is composed of uh, uh, Turkmen's and Kurds and Arabs, of mm. Shi'is and Sunnis, etc., etc. And, and you can say pretty much the same thing about almost every other state around the world. Mm. Uh, look at India, for instance. There is no way you can create a nation state in India. <laughs> but uh, I think that the, this very concept of a state as the unit of analysis for modern times, I think, it's, uh, it's uh, becoming uh, rapidly obsolete um, and it has to be replaced with something else. With what? Well, I'm thinking about it, but I'm sure nobody's going to ask for my opinion. But, <laughs> but the way things are, there, there's no way you can, you can call Sikkim and China as two nation states with equal rights, let's say in the United Nations at least. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to... Um, go further back in, in, in the talk, I think uh, when we were talking about uh, the uh, um, uh, Caesarian uh, birth of uh, uh, Julius Caesar, mm -hmm. um, I think that touches upon a, another concept where um, femininity uh, had been uh, kind of a, a put down for femininity. I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, that uh, uh, when we decide either to turn gods into humans or to reverse that pattern and make gods out of humans, mm -hmm. uh, in order for those humans to be made into gods, uh, the first thing is that they have to be taken away, as far away as possible from anything that is feminine, very feminine. Mm -hmm. And one of those is uh, vaginal birth, mm -hmm. uh, the immaculate conception. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and many of these other births of the great ones, it wasn't only Caesar. There was uh, Indira that was mentioned, but also Zal was mentioned and was oh, not mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, hero of the, uh, the Book of Kings. Uh, mm -hmm. He had also uh, had to be um, not only uh, given birth by a C-section. I don't know if they use the same alphabet. Uh, but also, uh, he was taken away from the mother and was raised by a bird. A bird, yes. In other words, creating this distance between the feminine, feminine mm -hmm. as a mother, feminine mm -hmm. as a symbol, feminine mm -hmm. as the organ of, uh, the very organ of femininity, create this distance so that they can become closer to God. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, there are a lot of inherent prejudices uh, in that, but since I mentioned Zal, I might as well uh, add another attribute of Zal was that he was uh, he had white hair, okay, uh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and again the yeah. white and the black and what we see in in the pigmentation of skin uh, as as a sign of prejudice today. Uh, in a way that was indicated through his um, pigmentation of the hair, if uh, we can use that term. Uh, yeah. So I think there are uh, layers and layers of these, uh, some of them touch upon the warrior culture mentality, others touch upon the masculine feminine dichotomy, others touch upon the tribal nation or nation states. And so I think all, all three of the examples that I share uh, shows that that uh, concept of divisiveness 
in the sense that I'm good only if I can define myself different than you. And difference simply does not mean difference, but different as superior and, and, mm. and higher than you. Yeah. Um, I don't know if uh, we have time to address these, but those are my uh, two cents worth, or I should make that three cents. Thank you. If I, if I might uh, dovetail off your first comment, Zaman uh, and John. So, Zaman, are you saying that the warrior mentality is in our DNA? Uh, no, I'm not saying that it is in our DNA. I'm saying that it's, uh, well, you can say it's in our cultural DNA. And in the cultural okay. DNA, you need, uh, you have to have an enemy. And if you can dehumanize them, no problem. But when you cannot demonize them, then you have to uh, at least, uh, sorry, uh, when, when you can, if you can dehumanize them, it helps. So we fight a particular people because they don't have the culture, they have the wrong religion, they have the wrong color, something like that. But if uh, the cultural relativism and the political correctness uh, is going to hold you back, then you can simply uh, define them in some ways, like instead of saying we are fighting against the Muslims, say, well, a war against terror. And, and that way, terror can be defined in any way you want to. But in the process, it would allow you to uh, uh, invade seven Muslim countries or prevent Muslims from coming in. In other words, all the signs of declaring the war against Muslims is there. However, because that doesn't sound politically correct, then you redefine it as war, war against terror. One of the things that I've struggled with is that phrase you just uttered. Why is it war on terror, which is more of an emotion, as opposed to terrorism, which is an action? I've, I've, and you don't have to answer that. I just wanted to throw that out. I, uh, I, it may be semantical, but I've always thought there's something wrong grammatically with that statement. It's like drive slow as opposed to drive slowly. It's just sloppy English. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I could respond to others who are also to respond to what uh, Zaman has said. Well, first off, uh, pe people, normal people, do not kill other people, they kill subhumans. So, this is probably why there are no Neanderthals around anymore, because we actually had some to kill at that time. But we have to debase uh, people that we have targeted to serve a function of, as an adversary. Um, and we do so more or less effectively by calling them savage and coming up with lies about how they take babies from incubators and throw them out and so forth. Um, that was the case with the Iraq war. Um, and a failure to do that generally results in an ineffective uh, military uh, act, uh, activation. And now there are societies that, that do not need uh, enormous uh, constancy, uh, um, military um, alertness or maintenance. Uh, they're generally small. Dagestan and say the Northeast Caucasus is an example. And they get along by virtue of the need for exogamy. They have to re maintain genetic viability. And so they, they swap partners. Uh, and Dagestan is interesting because they also have a, a preordained hierarchy for joining up. If there is, in fact, an external enemy, like a, a nomadic horde of some sort, like the Mongols or whatever that come, come in, want to subjugate the region, uh, they will band together in a layered fashion to resist, forget, forgetting about all their linguistic and, and other differences, which are sub actually substantial. And um, so um, there is a real need for groups to get along, and that is to maintain genetic viability. And that seems to be an important component for fairly peaceful coexistence. I myself had a lot of trouble in Washington. I, I never saw the Russians as enemies. I saw the Russians as people who had a very different set of values as a result of a very different history. Uh, but I, at times, was accused of being a spy because I wasn't running around and being part of the denounced Russia industry, uh, which was very much a kind of career in certain circles in Washington. Um, so once these things become entrenched, they're very hard to, to, to shut down. 
And what Putin has done to the detriment, I think, of Russia is entrench an anti-Western uh, dynamic in their culture now uh, as well. Um, now, political correctness, um, I know some of the, I knew one of the people involved in creating it. Uh, um, it's a question of whether you want, one, one person once said that political correctness at its silliest never did as much damage as its opposite uh, on a calm day. Um, so what we're seeing is basically a reversion back to pre, um, pre-etiquette pre -etiquette days uh, with racist remarks, racist commentaries and whatnot. Uh, as to Zal, I mean, Zal well, this is also the nation state, West, the Treaty of Westphalia and all this, um, even within Europe, the idea of a natural ethnic base upon which a state is erected hardly applies to any of the countries. Uh, there are Basques in Spain and France, I mean, uh, Catalonia, uh, you know, all this. Um, they certainly get outside Europe uh, and nations are aggregates. And I think you're entirely right. We need something bigger and more flexible as a kind of organizing principle for statehood in some way. Um, a statement was made not long ago on one of my programs about that, that you speak of. And it was said, uh, I made the comment, I said, well, you know, we need to tear down this particular institution and build up a new one that's more supportive of all of us and, 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 and so on and so on. And they said, no, 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 you do not want to tear down and then build a new one. You want to build a new one that makes the old one obsolete, whether it's education, religion, government, the economy, whatever category you want to list, you need to create the new one first that makes the old one obsolete. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think it's, it, that's, that's the peaceful form of evolution and, and change. Um, and that's the ideal goal. It would be the one that would, it would receive spontaneous and, and probably um, unreflective, just natural and spontaneous uh, endorsement by the population in some way. Uh, I can't think of a single instance, though, which has been done. <laughs> uh, because, because, of, uh, because of the inherent polarization of a cultured species between retention and innovation. The other thing about Zal is in uh, linguistics, uh, uh, this is cognate with ger or from geriatrics. Um, so the gub becomes the, the Z, the E is an A, and the R is an L. So he, his name literally means the old one, um, or meant the old one, probably in proto-Iranian. Um, and of course that explains his white hair, you see. Um, but I think the idea that he's taken and raised by a bird, uh, um, there's something about being raised by a bird that, uh, it, because Indra has a, a ride upon a, a large bird and, um, the Simur, which is the bird that takes Zal, loses a feather, somehow it has a magic feather that Zal uses. And then even in the Rig Veda, the bird that carries Indra down from heaven, uh, is shot by a demon and loses a big feather. Um, so there's some kind of very fancy, fancy story going on there. Uh, I'd love to know more, but uh, th there isn't any more, <laughs> I think. You know, before, uh, uh, thank you, and, and before I, I'd like to uh, get the, get the uh, audience in here in the next five or 10 minutes. And before we do, I just wanna see if, if uh, there's anything from Boris, Cindy, and Selena. I saw Cindy starting to ask a question a second ago. I, I look at this time as an amazing mythic moment, to be honest with you. And having taken Dennis's class in epics, I think we're in an epic moment. A lot of what you've said, John, has really resonated with me starting with the wine cellar of the human mind, that's what myth is. Mm -hmm. We are looking at the, the dark moldy parts of the psyche, I think, and the collective psyche, and I think that's really a neat way of looking at it. But I don't know that I agree that we are, that, that Trump and the Republicans are, are um, stuck in mythic thinking. I see it more as uh, kind of that we're caught between two mythic modalities or mythic structures where they are embracing uh, the capitalist 
um, individual uh, medieval to, to go with some of the dualities that um, have been brought up here today, uh, nation state mentality, mythology. And there's a, been an emerging one um, that we've seen kind of coming through since the mid eight, uh, maybe the 1800s or the mid 1800s forward that embraces the other dynamic, which is collective uh, planet, we the people, um, and kind of loses the duality, the duality thinking, the dualism that is needed by the other side to use the duality to create enemy to maintain the, their state um, mm. and their myth. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this uh, virus has brought down those walls in a way um, that hadn't been done collectively as a, as a, a planet until now um, because we see we are all in it together um, and if 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 dna defines us we our dna is the human species and we are threatened by um a biological um entity aspect whatever that um shows us our vulnerability to the nature of our planet and um, brings us together in a way that we haven't really seen um, maybe since, maybe never, I would say never in modern society, obviously, um, but definitely not since World War II. I had a conversation with my 92-year-old aunt today um, who said this feels very much like World War II to her the way they're all that everybody's resources are trying to be pooled and um people are stepping forward in ways they hadn't you know so i, I i'm i also by the way so i i see america as caught in that dynamic of the two mythologies as well <clears throat> And when you say, when you told the story about the lion, if a lion could talk, it wouldn't have anything to say to people. That's kind of what I see about our, our political parties. If they could talk, they wouldn't have anything to say to each other. And I don't think they speak the same language, have the same symbols. And um, part of the Democrats' problem is that when you have this kind of falling away of dualities, it's hard to have symbolism. The symbols start, <laughs> I'm not sure they know what they are yet, you know? I don't think they've emerged yet, maybe. Any thoughts on that? All right, well, look, um, let me say, let me start from a position that seems irrelevant, but leads to what I think you're saying. Um, the reason Trump won was because of the Electoral College. The reason we have, an you have an Electoral College is because the founding fathers, and there were no mothers, <laughs> the founding fathers basically didn't trust the masses. They thought they were riffraff and that an intelligent choice for a leader would have to be, be made by a select few that would be nominated to this college, electoral college. Um, now, about that time, linguists were um, beginning to work on languages like Latin and Greek and Sanskrit and uh, make uh, comparisons and retrieve the earlier form, the mother language, which is called Indo-European. Uh, and what happened, and I haven't seen a single uh, political science treatise that seems to recognize this. What it did was it took the peasantry of uh, at least Europe um, and said, look, these aren't just the great unwashed masses living in little mud floored uh, thatched that's uh, cottages. These are the heirs to an ancient language and an ancient culture and civilization. It's probably four or 5,000 years old. Um, so all of a sudden these people became very obstreperous and 1848 was a crisis year and practically uh, resulted in the toppling of the aristocracy across Europe and they were managed, just bar barely managed to suppress it. Right? Uh, so I think in some ways that with this kind of emergence of a whole the whole mass of, of, of society being important politically 
that there were certain choices that had to be made in handling and, and how you're going to represent it and what is it, how do you identify with it, what kind of identity you offer them. Um, so I think that the a grand old party, goes back to Lincoln, uh, has evolved in a fashion in which it's trying to promote the interests of a very small wealthy elite. And the idea is the old, the old claim that this will trickle down to the masses and they'll have jobs and even if the jobs are mind numbing and, and they pay poorly. So I think that that's basically at root what they're after. What they say and what they do, you know, something, you know, what they say is one thing, what they do is something else. Um, and I think you saw it in the tax break legislation they have. I think this $2 trillion bailout also was lopsided in certain ways. Now, the Democrats, I think, it literally means rule the people, um, try to zero in in some way and and make the lot of the masses a little a little better. The trouble is that that was limited in certain vital ways. So one thing I had a British friend who couldn't figure out why Sotomayor, uh, Sotomayor uh, was uh, when she was up for consideration of the Supreme Court was considered from a different race or something like that. And I said, look, in the United States, it's very hierarchical. It's capitalist, and if you're on the bottom, you can't be the same race. You got to be somebody else. And this is one of the great driving engines, I think, for racism against uh, people of African origin. I think it's a great driving mechanism for racism against people of uh, Hispanic origin. And they, you know, I see these weird things. I see Ocasio for Cortez, for example. To me, I don't know, she looks European. She looks Mediterranean. I don't know. And she considered a woman of color. Wow. You know, but why? Because she represents the poor people from, from a district who are the Bronx or something like that. Uh, so there are these strange uh, relics of thinking that, that even the, the glorious liberal Democrats drag along with them in some ways and don't seem to be aware of and haven't addressed in some, in some fashion. They will try to do this occasionally, but in some ways, if you stand back and you think, well, can they really pay and, and bring, elevate these people and still keep the same system? And I think Bernie Sanders is a good example of that. Free this, free that, free this, free that. And I, I think what bothered me about it was not so much he wanted to help everybody, but he used the word free. And we have, we, I can go to the hospital here, I don't pay anything. You know, I go to the doctor, I don't pay anything. You know, we have provincial health insurance. And, but is it free? No, it's not free. I'm not going to be handed a bill, but I have to pay a, a premium. And it would be the same thing if the universities were, were free in Bernie Sanders' sense. You would have to be paying somehow to, to, to pay those professors and sustain those buildings and whatnot property. So whenever I hear the word free and the politicians coming out of their mouth, I, I, I'm always very suspicious uh, of what's going on. But I do think in the last 200 years that we have a kind of new political problem that ties in with the issue of what is a nation state as well. And that is, if we're going to give political um, autonomy or power or influence to everybody, it's not at all clear how in the world it's going to be done. Because inherently this, this domain, unlike that of myth, is elitist and has a pyramid structure. There's going to be somebody at the top. And I want to I want to make sure we get to the audience as I promised uh, in all my messages that we'd spend a little bit more time with them. Uh, I'm aware that we've not heard from Selena and Voris. So as we go, uh, I, I want to make it a, a point to make sure we come to you. And if we get to the end and you haven't added anything, I'll, I'll make sure we ask you for for your final thoughts or something like that. Is that okay? Fair Perfect. enough. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Uh, and I see uh, uh, David Sickberg is is with us. Uh, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, Dana, in the introduction, had a really interesting link into the linguistic side of what John was talking about. The quote from Rumi that, uh, um, so I'm just wondering what kind of new language constructs can we develop that will help us move productively and humanely into the new future that's going to emerge post COVID-19. Um, how would we do that? And are there examples from the past of, 
of language changes that, uh, that, that help social evolution. Well, I can, I can give you an example. That's the 14th century, 1300s, the, the Black Death. is also the century in which English uh, underwent the most radical change. Uh, and we even have uh, people write, writing diaries and there's some, some documentation that says that, uh, you know, someone says, I'm 40 years old now and I don't talk the way I talked when I was a kid. Talk differently. Um, and it lost all of its case endings and all this weird stuff that they say, if you learn German, you encounter the, wow. the earlier patterns that would typify uh, old English. And so uh, it does have this impact, but as is the case of most linguistic change, it's spotty, it's sporadic, it differs from place to place, and the pre uh, preval or prevailing outcomes are almost impossible to predict. <clears throat> so I guess the question is whether we can willfully make changes or will this be something we'll just recognize in retrospect uh, and say, well, you see what the language change was, so this must have been what happened. Or can we kind of have our hands on the steering wheel and try to move it in a desirable direction? No, well, the changes are going to be probably less socializing, less grandstand, great, great big things. I imagine that you know, pro sports and whatnot, they'll, they'll have to have some sort of super zoom where they charge you to, to come and tune in and watch and, and this sort of thing until there's a vaccine. Um, so they, they'll find ways of making group money virtual from virtual groups uh, is my feeling. Now, maybe there should be a word for that. Um, and instead of shaking hands, elbow bumps and, uh, and instead of being cheek to jowl, you know, be farther apart. Uh, with this kind of technology, it's, it's obvious in some ways that we don't need great aggregations of people, that we can aggregate virtually and still pull off something very similar to what we'd do if we were all sitting together in a room. Um, so maybe there should be a word for some of that sort of virtual grouping. Uh, I, um, something I can't think of anything off the top of my head. <laughs> Um, I think there, uh, before we speak of the language, uh, I think we should talk about what is behind the language. Um, uh, let's take the um, Muslim world back in, in the Hades of the Islamic civilization. The emphasis was on, on the commonalities of languages. And they had Arabic and then they had umbrella languages that went throughout Africa and Spain and India and all that, where the emphasis was uh, how to speak where more and more words would be, more cognates would be shared across the different cultures and the linguistic barriers, and that would bring people together. Now, um, when European nationalism became kind of the modus operandi, the fashionable thing to do, to define yourself in terms of a nation state uh, that obviously had a language attached to it, uh, the trend went the exact opposite. Uh, neologisms are created where, for instance, why do the Serbs and the Croats hate each other? because they write, they speak the same language, but in different scripts. Uh, why do the Pakistanis and, and Indians try to, the Indians are trying to get rid of as much Arabic vocabulary from the Hindi. Hindi and Urdu were exactly the same. But they are, they are creating this, this distance. They are building these walls. Um, the uh, Persians, the Iranians are trying to get rid of anything that is Arabic, and they are calling that the purification, which uh, by itself uh, has, is a kind of loaded word. The idea is that these nation states in trying to define themselves in a national context are virtually creating barriers on walls, so they will be different from the others. And the more differences you emphasize, the less communication. And uh, the, the, the common 
human heritage is undermined by it because you become, let's say, a Persian first or a Pakistani first, and then whatever else that would be a shared common uh, human heritage, that, that is kind of, you know, uh, pushed aside, marginalized. Uh, so, uh, it, yes, we can speak a different language, but what will be the motivation with which we can speak it? So it's not literally the language itself, but whether we are moving towards more cohesion and cohesiveness or towards more division. Uh, and, and I think that that uh, should be uh, the, the most important thing behind it. I think a good example of that is Scandinavia. Um, where you have Danish, Swedish, two forms of Norwegian, then Faroese on uh, some little islands out uh, to the west, and then Icelandic. And basically, they're all dialects of one language. Um, but they've done everything they possibly can to, to, to make, make them seem different. But the other one, of course, is, is Serbo-Croatian. It's one language, but two, two scripts, and driven by... Um, a heritage of two different religions, the Roman Catholic with the Croats and uh, from Austria, and Orthodox Christianity from the Serbs with Russia and Greece. Yeah. So yeah, so it's, it's an important point. Um, if I can add just one more point to that, uh, many of us in this group, probably many of the attendees, have been very upset at how much our vocabularies have been shrinking in the last uh, decade even. Uh, however, that shrinking of vocabulary has the effect that Zaman is talking about and it, it makes the language more accessible to more people. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, English is easier to speak when there are less words. Uh, so so I, I, you know, it's interesting to see death of one thing and birth of another and, uh, and, I, and I do hope that, you know, we have new translation capacities. Uh, you know, of course, now the common language is code so I, I do hope, uh, and, and thank you, David, for your question. I, I do hope that we find ways to use language as a tool for enhanced inclusivity. I, I would say and add to that, uh, uh, Will, that that's a wonderful thing that the language and the vocabulary is shrinking and making it more accessible to the common man. Unfortunately, it also becomes less descriptive. Uh, I remember my ex-wife and her family, her father's uh, father, her grandfather came from Russia, got out night before the Bolshevik Revolution. Well, they were teaching me about some of the Russian words. And at least what they shared with me was that they didn't have a word for washer or dryer or car. All they had was the word machine. Mm -hmm. Not very descriptive when you're talking with someone so there is an upside but there's also the downside thank that you. you don't thank have the descriptive aspects thank you uh, christine i see you're with us do you have a question for us i am thank you and and i have to say william sapphire's column in the new york times magazine for years on language was one of my favorites um anyway um yeah i this whole uh and and what you're talking about language makes me think about uh, Chinese and Mao, uh, Mao Zedong did an amazing uh, uh, feat by creating the simplified Chinese uh, uh, characters so that everybody could read a set of, I think, 1,200 characters so everybody could read the newspaper and be educated. But at the same time, you lost the, 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 the nuance of the language. Um, but my question relates way back to, Will, what you were talking about, identity, and Richard, you talking about the de-anthropomorphization, um, um, and, and how it relates to everything now. Um, when I think about, and I had written this, uh, something along these lines as a question, we have, I think it's, there are events that we talk about, 9-11, we know exactly what it is, the Great Depression, the space race, World War II, and, we those those have uh, those have been personified by to me i think through the stories of the people so they've been given human attributes in a way or a human a life let's say the holocaust a life beyond just the the time period and when i think about what we're going through now um i, I wonder what this will be 
but also I, there was a change, a shift that I noticed when the media reported that we had found what it looked like. And all of a sudden it became this, this, this round orb sphere with, with pinkish things sticking out of it. And in a way to, to what, we were talk, what we were talking about in the beginning, it had a face and it wasn't a human face. And so it was perhaps a, um, it still looked like, you know, it could be a head, you know, with a stick figure body. And so it was in a way, I think in people's mind, it became a, 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 a I, well, I won't say human form, but a, but a form, a, li a living being that wasn't just a molecule. Or, uh, you know, anyway, so I was wondering, and, and especially um, Boris and, and Selena, since, since I would love for, to hear your comments about that, just since we haven't heard from you yet. Uh, I think you're, you're right about um, your insight here. And what I want to do is take it back to, to language again, and this will be short. Um, if we're going to wrestle with the new language, we have to come to grips with what our fundamental paradigms are that informs language today. And I would argue in terms of it's the reason why you have um, a diminution of the discussion of the nation state as related to our politics or people is because the new religion is not capitalism, but neoliberalism. And neoliberalism, simply put, reduces all social relationships down to the market, right? So familiar relationships, religious relationships, and mythic relationships are now being reduced to the market. So the primary myth of not only the United States, but uh, many of the global, uh, many nations in the global north, is essentially the market will save us. Well, that's not capitalism because even Adam Smith never argued for the sovereignty of the market. He never did. He argued that even the market needed a social safety net. So this re new religion, neoliberalism, is something we have to come to grips with. Uh, and 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 that's what that's what I would add to it because these assumptions are really fundamental to what it means to be not only an American but what it, what it means to be human. And what I'll end with is, in 2014, when uh, um, Clinton when she ran for office, what people don't talk about is that uh, the Citizens United bills were passed, and Citizens United argued that corporations are more human than human beings. They have just as much right to speak, to free speech, as human beings do. And I think that's been a fundamental kind of shift in what assumptions we take into the world. That's what I would add to it. And I'd just like to say, Boris, thanks for that. Um, and yeah, I totally agree with you. The market is definitely not going to save us, but we all together are going to help each other to save ourselves because mm -hmm. the culture, the culture that we live in is malignant and has been malignant for a while. And the doorways have been opened for the COVID to come through. If we look at, at the country as an individual, the malignancy opened the doors because I believe every society has their time and the darkness enters when it can. And the COVID being the darkness entered in this time. And so all of us doing our own personal work um, and working together, I think is in whatever way that we can as a culture, uh, not as for money, not as for uh, whatever, but it has to be as a whole. So I'm looking at this as a holistic perspective. That must move us forward. I think that one of the things that you're talking about, Selena, is the acknowledgement of what I'll call the divine feminine. Uh -huh. It is something that underwrites 
the patriarchy with language to start, with separation of the self from the collective to continue, but now throwing the economy in there as the solution that's somehow gonna get us all back on our feet is trying to resort to a wounded warrior that is going to kind of like heal the battle that we ourselves have found ourselves in. And until we can resume a love that is more universal, less individualistic, less coming out of projections, I don't think that this is going to resolve itself. And what we're really condemned to do is find a way out of this and leave ourselves as a separate self behind. Mm -hmm. that, that, as long as we have our identity attached to patterns of individualized self-constructions, I think we're, we're, we're destined to, if not this virus, some other virus. If not this pattern of hate, some other pattern of hate. We have to find new vocabularies for love. I would add to that something I've been promoting on my program, 2020, the year of perfect vision, where we go within to find the guidance, to find the insight, the peace, the calm, the support that is needed. And uh, I encourage everybody to take that time, especially if you're at home, you've got the time. So go for it. <laughs> thank you, Richard. And I wanted to mention that, that uh, show as well. So thank you. Uh, and I think we've got time for one more question, and uh, then we will uh, begin wrapping up and hear uh, John's final thoughts for us. And, uh, and Tara, who's been with us on the panel, I think joined us a little late. Mm -hmm. so I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you can ask a question. Hi, Tara. Hi, thank you so much. Yeah, I actually have two questions, um, and I'll sort of put them up there, and then I'll, I'll mute and, and take the responses because I want to be mindful of time. One of them is um, when, when John Colarusso was speaking, he, I, it made me wonder if in a way Donald Trump isn't sort of running a version of, I don't know, something like a cross between the Stanford experiment and the Milgram shock experiment. Um, because he's essentially gotten people to do things that perhaps they might not otherwise do. You know, we're getting to the banality of evil question. Um, that's one of my questions. And then the other one is actually Leaping off of one of my teachers, Lionel Corbett, um, when we were talking about, I think it was, um, I, I apologize if I, I don't get the address right, but did you say Reverend Dr. Dugan um, was talking about um, the part about needing to have an enemy and propping ourselves up by having an opponent. Um, and, and I think it, I, I, Lionel might correct me, but I think he would say that that's a defense against potentially fear or grief um, and that culturally that's often perceived as a weakness and the, the, the transition that hasn't been made in our culture yet um, is perhaps a failure to recognize that meeting or entertaining or engaging with grief and fear can be valuable, transformative and courageous. Um, and, and so I think I would like to leave it with just that. Thank you so much. And I would never debate that. I would agree with you on what you've said. And at the same time, uh, we need to move on to a new paradigm, as has been mentioned. Uh, we need to move beyond dualism. If you look out into the universe, there is no dualism in the universe. We'll look through the Hubble telescope at the universe moving about and colliding and exploding. And we go, ooh, ah, but we don't see it as good or bad. Well, all the way down to the microscopic level, it all just is, uh, according to the Hindus, what we perceive as good and evil, right and wrong, good and bad, is maya. It's an illusion. The reality is everything is all a part of the whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I might ask, John, uh, I wonder if uh, you could respond to that question uh, and, and also shift into maybe your final thoughts. Okay. Well, let me, uh, let me just say a, a cautionary, uh, let me make a cautionary remark here. Um, uh, Zaman, I think it was you, Zaman, who, who uh, emphasized how the special birth 
was uh, the, uh, taking the hero away from the feminine uh, as far as possible. Um, and um, uh, in the, the, one of the tales uh, that I translated from the Caucasus, uh, um, the, the hero is, is both taken away that way and then later also uh, storms out after an argument uh, with uh, not just even his mother, who's in the background, but his nurse. Uh, so one removed from that. And yet the women and the cultures of the Circassians originally uh, there are, are some assimilating now to, to cultural patterns in Jordan and, and Syria. But originally the women enjoy very lofty prestige. They were seen as the repository of wisdom and knowledge and the men were just seen as, as bravado souls out there to sort of protect everything and were expendable. And there are these tales in which the, the, the woman, even though she's been kidnapped, has to explain to the supposed hero how he's supposed to release her from the clutches of, of the demon. Um, and it's another thing too that, for example, um, uh, the issue of, of pronouns, we were having some kerfuffle about this with the University of Toronto and some students here, that the idea that somehow language shapes your thinking, it's true to some extent. But for example, there are languages, say like Japanese, where there's absolutely no gender at all. There's no distinction made at all. And yet the, the women were, were virtually like domestic animals uh, traditionally. Um, and there are other cultures in which there, there is all this gender, he, she, it, and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and, um, and, and yet uh, the women, um, uh, also were, were, were quite w uh, well regarded, particularly uh, in the Old Norse and this kind of thing. So the patterns are there. They seem to be sort of built in and they pop up, uh, but it's not entirely clear if someone uses one, to what extent that precludes more flexible and adaptive attitudes that might emerge under different circumstances. Um, so I'm not surprised to see the, the kinds of, of regression, uh, ugliness, uh, racism, uh, prejudice, uh, intolerance that Trump has elicited. Uh, and I think that um, this kind of thing is, is very common throughout practically every country on earth. It's just a question of whether or not it's being given uh, a chance to emerge in some way and of course, he's totally in principle a moral person, um, and he's been using it to to prop up his his um, his political career. Um, but again, I think that those same people, uh, some of them anyway, might decide that this was wrong. I originated originally in Mississippi, and uh, I had a, a pappy as a baby. Uh, an old old man, an old black man born in slavery named Old Richard. And uh, of course, with Mississippi, you know, there were the lynchings and the racism. And, oh my God. You know? And when my mother died, um, and I was 25 years old, I went back to Mississippi and I met the old relatives and they said we were wrong. We were unfair. We were wrong to the black people. We were unfair and we should not be that way. And I was astounded. This was out of nowhere. Um, and so people can change. People can see that they are, are being ugly, that they are being cruel or mean, and can change their ways, but given a slight push. Uh, so I, I remain cautiously optimistic about the future of the United States and about uh, the future of the world generally, because I think that there are some angels of good nature buried down inside uh, in the fog there somewhere. Um, just need a chance to, uh, to let them come out and shine a bit. Thank you, John. What a wonderful note to end on, optimism and our inner angels. Uh, <laughs> and um, we'll, we'll shift over to Dana, who will bring us out. And first, I'll just say, uh, if you're interested in uh, this event, uh, the recording of this event or previous events, you can find those on mythosophia.net. Uh, and if you're interested in more of John, you'll find a full series uh, from him 
uh, on mythosophia.net. And if you're interested in more with Richard, you'll find uh, a full series that we did together on the same, mythosophia.net. Um, so please check those out. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, John. Thank you, Richard. And thank you to the entire panel. Um, and Dana, I hope uh, on that note of optimism, you'll, you'll bring us to a close. Well, thank you very much, Will. Again, it's, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure to sit through another myth salon with the brilliance of the human psyche. Uh, we have, we have a, a tender, loving, compassionate group. To that end, I would say, as we are learning this, if there are people in the audience or among the panel can provide me and you with some kind of feedback through email, do this, don't do that, one thing and another. This is a learning curve. This is a very steep learning curve for me to try to figure out, you know, what it is that um, we're doing. Um, and I don't have it down. I don't. So anyway, I love you all. Back to the bowl. Gonna ring it once. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Love you all. Be safe, everyone. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you all. Good night. Namaste. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.